Sunday. Oh, have you missed me? Well, we've been on the road and today we are back live in the studio. If you are not watching or if you're watching, you want to tell your friends, share Omega TV UK to everyone on your contact. Let them join and let's have a wonderful conversation with an amazing woman who has gone through hell and back you know there's so many stories out there whether man whether woman you know of abuse mental health but some get up they get back on their feet and thrive and this afternoon we have one person who has done that and she's going to share her story with us welcome evangelist naomi praise how are you i'm very well thank you so much happy Pastor sunday Nanny. Thank you. Happy Sunday to you. <laughs> you know, um, you're looking amazing. I was oh, going to thanks. speak French, but then I was trying to construct my French sentence. Um, I know, ça va. Oui, ça va très bien, merci. Um, vous allez, well, and, and then we say to a belle, you're looking beautiful. How do you say? Merci beaucoup. Tu es très belle. Oh, très belle. Okay, <laughs> I still remember my friend. How many of us? How many of us? made it to the French classes. You know, when we were in school, yep. when the French master is coming, everybody ran off. But today I regret. So please, you know, if your parents are telling you to study French or some language, don't shy away from it because one day you need it. Yeah. So tell me where in the, in the world you come from that you speak French. Okay, I am originally from the DRC, Congo, Kinshasa. Okay, um, diamonds. Yes, we are there. <laughs> That's all about us, the diamond, the Colton and stuff. That's us. That's where I'm from in the part of the world and that's Central Africa. Yeah, and uh, before we dive into our conversation, I know um, DRC have been in war for a long time. Yeah. Is, it, is it peaceful now or are you still in war? They are very much um, still in war. There's no peace at all. There's actually a silent genocide that is going on in the Congo currently. Um, in the eastern of Congo, especially at like the Kivu side of the Congo, the women are being raped, children are being killed, you know, and being used to do mining and stuff like that instead of allowing them to go to school. And Rwanda is really trying to invade that eastern part of the Congo so that they can continue to be stealing and controlling our country. So that's oh. what's been happening. Um, but our president, um, Felix mm. Chishikedi, is doing his very best mm. that I can see mm. to really change things around. Um, so I am, I'm very proud of him for that. But we still need a lot of work um, doing in, in the Congo. There's too much war going on. Wow. Uh, I, we pray that with all that is going on in our world today, we pray that, you know, peace come and, uh, you know, there's children can go to school and talking about that you were born you grew up there or you grew up here in the uk i was born in the congo but i grew up here so all my life i've done it here in the uk oh fantastic and you jenny thank you for the coming all the way from looting and, and joining us You're here welcome. in the studio today we we want to dive into the woman that you have become because there are so many women who are out there and going through a lot. I mean, there's stories upon stories upon stories, and your story is so unique, but look at the beautiful woman that you have turned out to be. <laughs> you know, if, if people will hear and, and people will think, once upon a time, this lady was almost starved to death. This lady was bitten, was abused by your stepmother. Let's let's dive into it. If your stepmother shout out to you, we we pray that you don't do that to your stepchildren. But <laughs> hey, so tell me, growing up at home, like how it was like. Thank you for that uh, question, Pastor Nana. Growing up at home, it was um, very hard. I would say it was a period where um, every child wants to enjoy their childhood, but for me, it wasn't like that. It was very difficult. Um, and I don't care what anybody wants to say at the moment um, when they hear this, but this is my story mm. and I'm sharing my testimony mm. according to my personal experiences and what I have seen. Mm. So childhood was very difficult, was very uh, painful. Um, um, coming into the UK, 
um, I was staying in my guardian's um, um, house and stuff. So I think I was around uh, six, six, five, if I could vividly remember. And during those times, I was, I was a child, but I was seen. Pastor Nana, I was a child then, but I was seeing, and my eyes were seeing what was going on mm -hmm. and how they were literally treating us. Um, so we we became children who were so sad even in school. So at home, it was a thing where even if you do something right, they won't appreciate you. So we were living in a shelter, but we were not free. We weren't feeling like we were, you know, safe. We were in a shelter, but we are not safe because normally when somebody's um, in a shelter, has a shelter, they feel safe, right? Mm. But then in our case, um, we weren't feeling safe at all. When you say we, who were, I know you're a twin. So was it just you and your twin sister, brother? It was me and my twin sister. So mm -hmm. she's a female as well. Mm -hmm. um, so the both of us mm -hmm. were going through the same thing. Mm -hmm. But I was getting it the most. Were you the naughtiest? That was why you were getting it the most? <laughs> or, uh, you know, sometimes people get punished because, yeah. because they're like, yeah. okay, they're the one who re is the rebel. Were you mm. a rebel or you were just that quiet, shy girl and you were still, you know, going through that? I wasn't the quiet, shy girl because between me and my twin sister, I am the loudest one wow. and she's the quiet one. Mm. But um, they used to pick on me a lot mm -hmm. um, because I was the one that was speaking things out, like mm. um, snitching, I would call it. Uh -huh. <laughs> I was the one that was snitching. I was the one that was talky, talky, talky a lot. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, but we were both getting the same treatment. So growing up, um, we thought we could have that motherly love, but we, we never experienced it. For me, I would, I would talk for myself, that like I never experienced that motherly love because I wasn't able to share my pains um, with the women um, that we were living with in the house. We were getting beaten up at a young age like that. Um, yes, you know, we are kids. Yeah. And at the time, we were kids. Yeah. So... Kids are not perfect. We do wrong things. You know, we make mistakes and we do get punished here and there. But with us, it was no longer punishment. It was no longer discipline. You know, I do understand that um, our African parents, you know, disciplined us in a way that it was just unfair. But our <laughs> own... <laughs> African parents. Mm -hmm. Shout out to African parents. Shout out to you, mamas. <laughs> and and <that> is <laughs> Yes. So um, that is understandable. Mm. But um, our own level of um, punishment was really severe. I wouldn't call it punishment anymore because we weren't um, learning anything from what she was doing to us. You know, and I don't want to call out any names, mm. but um, but um, it was a point where we was doing chores that she should be doing, the adult in the house should be doing. We were doing those chores. Chores like what? Washing dishes. Come on now, um, no, Washing we dishes. We were very young. How old was this? We were like six, six, seven, and stuff like that. But it wasn't like once uh, once in a while thing yeah. it was an everyday thing you wow. know and 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 um she would hit us wow Th that's the point where yes. it gets to like okay if if you're teaching us how to wash dishes you know at least be nice about it yeah you know um but she she was just maltreating us insulting us calling us names even if we didn't do anything she would just find something to belittle us why because she didn't like any um any of her husband's family members to stay in the same house as her. Right, and where was where was the, the father? Where was daddy at she, that time? He was there. He was there. Um I would I would I would say that was my uncle. Um he was there. He was seeing everything. And even if we was reporting it to him, he didn't really do anything. He just thought, oh okay, it is his wife just trying to uh punish the kids and stuff, but it wasn't like that because it came to a point where she was using objects like wooden spoon that we cook for four. She would use it to beat us under our toes. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, yes, uh, I bet we, you know, African parents, shout out to us. 
and sometimes yes we want to teach the kids some some senses mm. and you know um back home we all got the beating and but here i know that if you smack the next thing is social services is coming to knock exactly. at your door yeah when you went to school did do did all these affect your studies that in school you could not concentrate on on on, on your education um of course but at the time mm -hmm. i didn't even know that it affected me like that um i didn't know anything about mental health i didn't even know that it ever existed mm -hmm. but i was going through it mm. you know there's so many people who are going through mental health even young people they're going through it but they don't actually know that they're going through it mm. so that was my case she would even use um a knife you know to beat us wow. and stuff it was it was really bad it was really bad even if we begged her she wouldn't listen she would just maltreat us for no reason we didn't understand why she was treating us like that and then um in school it was affecting the way that we were studying and even communicating with people it came to a point that we started getting bullied in school as well so we were being bullied at home and also being bullied in school and how how did how did they affect you in uh, you know yes the mental health but as i said earlier on and I asked, how did he affect your studies? Okay, thank you so much for that. Um, I wasn't doing so well with my maths. I wasn't doing well with um, most of my um, courses in, in class. My teachers were so concerned. Um, they were even seeing bruises in my face, bruises in my body. Um, they were wondering what was going on and I was scared to speak up and tell them anything because at home they said to us, anything that goes inside the house doesn't come out. Mm. If it comes out here, yeah, you're in trouble. You get even worse than beatings. <laughs> Double beatings. <laughs> Double beatings. So we had to keep quiet about it, but it came to a point that our friends in school, you know, um, were noticing um, everything that we were going through. So because I was the most, you know, chatty one mm. and a bit open one, and I started to explain it to my friends that were welcoming me, mm. because um, when I started school, I didn't know English. <laughs> I didn't know English at all. Um, so I was learning the English and people were mocking me, laughing at me because I didn't know English. I wasn't accepted um, in, in school by friends because of language barrier. Uh, but I did force myself to learn and stuff. Um, but I was still getting bullied. <laughs> It was really hard. Nobody wanted to be my friend. Nobody wanted to be around me wow. and stuff. It was really hard. And so what changed? Okay, everything changed because I met one friend, one friend in the school that was able to help me. Yeah. Um, she was really nice. I was telling her my issues and stuff. Um, she was also allowing us to go to her house. You know, at the time after school, we would rush to her house and play around. Um, she would help us with um, homework as well. And then I got into um, the hang of everything. My English grew and I was um, learning and stuff, but still I was in pain. I was forcing myself to go to school and learn. That was in primary school. I am literally talking about um, how this whole thing, mm. the physical abuse affected uh, me in primary school. So um, I wasn't doing too well with my grades and I became like, very aggressive. Yeah, so any little thing that um, someone did to me in school, I would get angry and, and then it would turn into like a fight and stuff. So you now became a gun. <laughs> you became a... <laughs> so you were now bullying other kids? No. Or you were, you were fighting other kids because of what you were going on, what was going on within you? Because sometimes kids... It's what happens to kids at home that they bring to school and exactly. bring outside. And sometimes we think, oh, why is this child or this boy, this girl behaving this way? But then we forget that they're coming from a home and a toxic, it home. Stems, a toxic home and that stems from home. So, you know, when you see these kids on the street and, you know, they misbehaving, sometimes we've got to really take time and find out why they're behaving that way so who was the person that really helped you to come out of this go to secondary school and all that nobody so how did you how did you progress I, I just progressed like we got we got used to the whole situation and we started to pretend like nothing was happening 
um, we were not talking about it anymore. We'll, we'll get beats and it was just like a normal thing now. We thought, okay, it is fine for, um, for you to be beaten all the time. If you look at my back, there's marks of beats, scars. Wow. So we just got used to it because I was, I was tired of explaining to their friends, you know, look, this is what, you know, um, mom and dad, this is what they're doing to us and stuff like that. And each time they try to speak to them to treat us well because they were telling them, look, you both need to treat these kids very well because if you don't treat them well, if you don't stop how you're maltreating them, it's going to turn against you in the future. And they didn't listen. Um, so... I, I, I literally just thought I was, I was just wasting my time because nothing was changing. So we just carried on with the life, you know, just carried on with it and just lived on with it like as if it was normal. And how are you now? I'm fine. You're fine. Perfect. I mean, free, very fine. Very fine, free. And how are they? They're How? still here, they're still alive. They're still, they're still alive, they're still here. They they are watching me growing, they're watching me doing what I'm doing now, doing ministry, and they are in shock. Wow. I they can't approach me. So I mean, this is this is somebody who's gone through so much and we can show the scars because then it means we have to show the world everything. everything. <laughs> but the people that sometimes, you know, um, abusers or mistreaters, you know, sometimes they don't know what, what blessing is upon your life. And if you're out there and you're watching, you might be watching, you might be thinking, oh yeah, right. But then you are maltreating your son, maltreating your daughter, mm -hmm. doing something to your wife, doing something to your husband. Maybe today is a, is, is, is a, is a message for people to change and, and be kind and love people because we live in a world that you never know what's coming for you. So you 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 were able to finish school now. Evangelist Naomi is she's a mental health <coughs> advocate. She's an author. She's a wife. She's a mother. And this is somebody who went through trauma that you think you know it's over. So it's not over for you. It's so not over for you. So you went to secondary school and yes. what did you pursue there? Um, so after secondary school, I just want to clarify something mm, that mm. Um, happened mm. in the primary school yeah. and those periods of abuse and stuff. Mm. So um, in school, the teachers realized that something was wrong with us because we weren't talking. So they, they now um, associated the social services. But then... Um, they tried to call in the parents to come in and discuss and they lied and they said no everything's fine and they said to us if you both try to say anything you will see make sure you tell them everything's fine don't even give them any head nothing wow and we were just like okay okay you know mm -hmm. we were scared because mm -hmm. we were living with a controlling and manipulative and very toxic uh, uh, uh people in the house so we weren't allowed to say anything so um so then they 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 tried all they did to us the social services um was trying to take us and they refused they refused um but then later on i didn't get a help from any professionals from anybody so i just learned to pick up myself and um to move on going into secondary school it was still hard um i was still getting bullied very much in secondary school the bullying was even very <laughs> worse it was very bad wow um the bullying was very bad i i i struggled to settle i struggled to settle because um i was being bullied by um the caribbean people especially um the jamaican people i was getting bullied by them Why? um just for the mere fact that i was um african just for the mere fact that I was from the Congo. So they were bullying me because I was from Africa. They would insult us, oh, African people, look at uh, them like monkeys and stuff. They're dirty and yeah, stuff. And dear Lord, it was so surprised. bad, it was, it was so bad. I actually had to go in depth about my bullying story in, in my first book, which I, mm. I, I don't have here, but it's on Amazon. Yeah. Um, but um, I was getting bullied for those reasons. I was getting bullied also because we weren't looking good in school. We weren't dressing well. Our clothes wasn't clean. Um, 
our hygiene wasn't good because we were going into school you know we would expect the adult to you know check us out and stuff and ensure that our hygiene is good and stuff um and um that wasn't happening so we started getting bullied we would wear the same school outfit do you know every year you know yeah you change um um school uniforms and stuff it wasn't that case for us all the time it wasn't we would wear the same school jumper that we wore last year we would wear um, the same socks that we wore last year we would wear the same shirt that we wore last year so she wasn't spending on us and she was using our benefits you know for her own gain and we were the ones suffering we were the one going through it we weren't getting any pocket monies and stuff and it led us to start stealing wow so <sighs> you were stealing yeah and got caught at one point yeah and as I said, if if this is this is your mum or stepmother or you know your hygiene, so I come back to say, you know, let's check our girls, let's check our boys. The hygiene, we've heard Naomi's story, and sometimes you can pick it up. I, this is an educational conversation, you know, an eye opening for us to to see the kids around us, to see whether you're a teacher, you. Social, whoever you are, and we see this in in the news all the time that kids are being bullied, and sometimes even to the extent that you know they get killed and nobody picks it up. Mm. So maybe this conversation will save somebody, will save a child, will save mm. a girl, will yeah. save a boy. You never, never know. So let's keep our eyes open. But you were able to go past that. How were you? I want you to tell us how you were able to go past this. Okay, I was able to go past um, all of those things because I, I, I discovered my relationship with God. Um, at the time, we were attending a Pentecostal church. So I first of all started with a Catholic church growing up as a child and then um, moved on to a French Connection Pentecostal church. That's where I now joined the choir. That's where I discovered that I can sing. I think I was around the age of 11, um, 11, 10, those ages, like nine, I started singing in the choir. So then um, knowing Christ helped me to navigate how I dealt with people in school as well. So what I started to do was to try to communicate with my bullies. I tried to communicate with them. I was like asking them if they, uh, if I did anything wrong to them, you know. And then they started to tell me um, why, why they treat me the way they do. And they said they just don't like me because you're just weird. You're just different and stuff. And I'm like, what can I do to change that? Um, so they started to invite me in their little crew and stuff like that. Um, and then they now started to love me in the way that I was, you know, showing myself to them, talking to them and um, trying to not really do what they're telling me to do because bullies, they like their bullies to do what they want them to do. Otherwise, things are just going to not work out. Mm -hmm. So um, I was trying to, you know, just trying to help them do their homework and stuff like that, trying to be kind and stuff. We were even selling our sweets and stuff. Like I told you, yeah. we were stealing um, just so that we can eat chicken and chips, two pounds chicken and chips <laughs> or have snacks at lunchtime in secondary school. So um, selling those sweets, uh, me and my twin sister so saved us as well. So you steal the sweets and sell it? And sell it in to school. To eat lunch? <clears throat> to eat at uh, break time and even after school wow. just for us to get like two pounds fifty chicken and chips i like the way you said two pounds fifty two chicken pounds and <laughs> <laughs> two pounds chicken and chips yeah wow yeah so um and then the way i navigated it it was it was hard but then i had to um I had to show show more love that I didn't get even the time that I was getting bullied. 
So it was it was a time where I was trying my best to be nice, but things was just not working. It's like the more I am nice to them, the more they were being horrible to me. They started fighting me. So what I had to do was to defend myself. Um, it was a fight, one last fight that I had um, in Bruce Grove Road near near the McDonald's in um, Tottenham. These two ladies, they were a year above me and they were start insulting us for no reason just after school. And they start calling us names. So we got angry and we said to them, can you leave us alone? And they didn't listen. One slapped me and then after I took over, I pushed one by the side, the um, roadside. The car nearly hit the girl. And... Um, there were so many people packed and this whole situation led into like the police and stuff but we weren't in trouble instead they were in trouble and I said to myself never again am I going to fight anybody even if they bully me because they even started to call me man beast because I was just fighting anyone that was fighting me <laughs> so everything that was happening at home was making you become this girl this yeah young adult Ag yeah aggressive aggressive um and so defensive um and i was i was taking everything personal because i just wanted to voice out i just wanted someone to hear me to listen to me like hello i'm suffering hello can somebody understand me and stuff mm. because at home no one was listening to us we didn't have a voice we weren't allowed to speak. We were silenced. So who eventually heard you after going to church? Were you able to talk to somebody in church about what was going on at home? I was able to speak to my pastor at the time, and I was able to speak to my mentor that I had in secondary school. You need a tissue? <laughs> yeah. Can I get a tissue, please? I'm so are you Are you okay? Yeah. It's just um, the past, you know. The things that one can go through can be so overwhelming. Um. I'm sorry. Maybe we we'll go for a break. We or we'll go for a break and we come back. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. My name is Kofi Adoko. I'm a principal solicitor at Adoko Solicitors. I am also a duty solicitor. Anytime a person is arrested and taken to a police station, or if the police invite you to the police station for a voluntary interview, you have a right to free independent legal advice. Adoko Solicitors is authorized to provide free independent legal advice at police stations in England and Wales. So anytime you're taken to the police station, remember to say that your solicitors are Adokos solicitors. Are you in the UK and in need of immigration help? Do you require expert legal representation to regularize your stay or renew your existing leave to remain? Do you require advice or representation regarding a personal injury or criminal matter? If the answer is yes, then you do not need to look any further. Aduku Solicitors is here to provide you with all the expert legal advice and representation you require. Be it immigration, criminal law, appeal against conviction or appeal against sentence, family law, personal injury, civil litigation, employment law or housing law. Aduku Solicitors is your trusted one-stop legal services provider with expert solicitors and caseworkers on standby to assist. Our police station emergency number is 07792 459 339. You can also call Aduku Solicitors on 0207 183 1479. You can locate Aduku Solicitors at 662 Old Kent Road, London, SE15 1JF. Well, we're back. If you're following our story, we're having a conversation with Evangelist Naomi Praise. And how do you, how do you pronounce your surname? Kabesele. Kabesele, you yeah. know, and sharing her story of, I would say, from, from, grass to grace or from hell to heaven you know there are so many people out there who have wounds that are are in there 
they cannot speak up because of what they've been through and and the saddest thing is that sometimes is the loved ones the people who are supposed to love us they are the one who they are the ones who who hurt us and it's it takes the good lord it takes um people like evangelist praise to voice out it takes people to sit down and say i'm going to share the story so that we see somebody so if you're watching today we have to go for a break because i mean it's a is a deep conversation and sometimes we have to have this conversation so that people will heal if you're one of them i pray that you're healing and as we continue the uh, conversation you will also share and get your friends and your loved ones to tune into omega tv uk how are you feeling I'm fine. Thank you. Thank and you with all the beautiful tears, <laughs> with all the beautiful tears, she's, she's smiling. That's fantastic. Yeah. So we, you, you were able to speak to somebody yes. about it. Yes. I was able to speak to my mentor. Mm. Um, his name is Damas, mm. Mr. Damas. Um, um, he really helped me during my whole journey in secondary school. He was advising me and because he was like a father figure to me in the school, so he was really helping me to mm. overcome all those things. So um, I was I was able to confidently say that um, I was I was okay in secondary school from year ten, mm. going to year eleven and then to college, and then things even got worse again. Yes, my life was l literally a school, a home, church, school, home, but it was difficult. Um, so I grew up as a church girl, and. Um, um, it came to oh how how do i start saying this just okay. breathe have a drink a nice <laughs> cocktail for you yeah thank you so during um our preparation for gcsc my twin sister got um illegally deported from the congo um so they they planned some evil act they liked to ask that we had to go on a holiday to Germany, um, but it was all lies. We went to um, Gatwick Airport. At the time, I didn't even know the name of the airport and stuff. So I was very naive, um, didn't know anything, didn't know how to call the police, didn't know how to contact anybody. I was stuck in one place, no one to 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 call. It, it, was, it, was, it was basically like they put um, um, boxes and put us in one inside of that box no one can hear us nothing wow so um then they now said oh the passports like all of our passports wasn't working they needed to do something about it so we had to return but the only two passports that was okay was my twin sisters and my uncles so um that time i didn't know nothing about passports i was only a child so um she got deported. I never got to say bye to my twin sister. And when we got home, um, I, I, I asked um, if everything was okay. And then she said, yeah, everything's fine. But I just need to let you know that uh, uh, your dad has deported your twin sister. I was, I was like, what do you mean deport? Yeah. She's gone back to Congo. Oh my goodness. Pastor Nana, where I was, I felt like my heart was ripped into two pieces. It's like, I felt like they've taken a part of me off. Something has been missing. So I was asking her, how would you let something like this happen? And she said, shut up. You have no right to um, question me and stuff like that. And I was like, but it's your husband. You should know. You should know what, what he's up to and stuff. And she didn't want to answer me. Very controlling, very manipulative. So... Um, it was that, and ever since that day, my attitude um, even changed in the house. I wasn't eating. I wasn't um, communicating with them like I was before. You know, even when they were um, beating us and stuff, I had a little bit of respect for them. But ever since that time, I lost my respect for them um, as as adults. And then, um, and then um, I tried to help her, send her money, send her food because. It took me years to even find out if she was alive or not. It took me many years. So um, I was trying to send money to her, you know, clothes and from someone there. And they found out that I was doing this. So I had to stop because they didn't want me to speak to her either. Did, didn't want me to have any contact with her. So back home where she was, she wasn't studying. She wasn't um, um, 
eaten well. They weren't sending her money. They weren't giving her any help. They just uh, abandoned her, just left her in the Congo to die. And then um, with me, what they did with me here that was left in the UK, they now um, connived and um, sent um, a, a man that was really, really old than me, a man, um, so he can come and abuse me. Uh, and then I will give him papers if they notice that I get pregnant. So with... Did you report? Did I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but this is so deep. Did you report to, you know, did you go to the police? Did you get to the social They didn't team? want me to. They stopped me to do all of that. I was surrounded by them. Like, there was nowhere for me to run. How old were you then? Um, I, I think I was about 16, 15. Wow. 16, 15. Wow. Um, so then, um, just imagine you are under their roof. So everything they say goes. You ain't got nowhere to run. You ain't got no one to speak to on your side. So what are you going to do? You will just have to defend yourself and stuff. But it came to a point where they were starving us. You know, not allowing us eat the right. food that we wanted to eat. So it was it was hard for me. Um, then I I didn't know that they were doing all these things to me. Um, and then I felt pregnant after the so abuse. This man that was all the man that was brought in to a sixteen year old. Yeah, the wife connived and um, slept with you. Yeah, when you got pregnant. Yeah, and and what happened? And um, they started to continue to abuse me um, emotionally, uh, financially, um, spiritually, and physically. They even started to abuse my princess. You know, it was, it was really hard that I had to take the decision. When I found out that they were doing all these things to me, um, so what their plan was, was for me to get pregnant um, after the abuse so that he can get papers in this country. And then he got the papers? No. No. I didn't allow him to get the papers, especially when I found out. Um, um, I, I, I refused to sign any papers for him. He doesn't have any papers. Um, and so where is the... Did you, did you have the baby? Yes, yes. You still have the baby? Yes, yes. Wow. Yes, and, yes. and did you involve... So now you, you're an adult and all that has happened when you were pregnant and going through that were you able to speak to somebody at least you could have i was talking to my friends in college not the friends an adult like a social service no you still didn't get no. the chance to speak to anybody no i still didn't get the chance i still didn't get the chance to call the police i didn't get the chance to speak to any professionals I was living in a home that doesn't care about professionals that are um, scared of the police. They don't like to hear 999. They don't want to have anything to do with no government. Like, that's the kind of home that I was brought up in. So they were dealing with their own things on their own. Even if it was that dangerous, they would deal with it and no one would know. Okay, so now you, you're, 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 you're an adult now. You, you were able to go to uni? I was able to go to uni, but it was really hard because I dropped off twice. Um, I had to run away from home, me and my princess, I think it was around 2013, 14. So when you had her, how old were you? Um, I was not 18 yet though. I can't, wow. I know that I wasn't 18 at the time. Um, but, um, it was, it was a time where I saw that even whilst I was going to university, coming back home, I would see my baby really dirty and not looking good. And if I tried to complain, there'll be trouble in the house. So it came to a point, one of my friends in, in the church said to me, Naomi, you need to find a way to leave that house. Cause if you don't leave that house, she will end up killing you in the house one day. So I thought she was just joking and stuff. But then once um, she actually threatened me, the wife threatened me and said, one day I will just stab you. I'll just kill you and you will die. And she was standing like at the door and you will die. And even if I go to prison, I don't really care. I will um, come out and you will rot six feet under and I don't care. And I was like, wow, wow. And, um, Ever since she said that, I took very seriously to, you know, leave the house. But I didn't want to leave 
like letting them know that I'm leaving because they would prevent me from leaving. Mm. They will lock the door and everything. It's just not gonna work. So I planned something um, within me. Yeah, just <laughs> yeah. I did a very serious escape. I threw like um, bin bags. So I put all my baby's um, important stuffs. I left everything that I had in the house, everything, most of my documents, everything. Mm -hmm. But I only brought my kids' stuffs that are most important and then I packed it in a bin bag. She came in and saw me cleaning the room and she thought, oh, your room looks clean, your room looks nice. I'm like, yeah, I'm just trying to clean and stuff. But she didn't know my plan. So, um, And then during the night, because we were living in a flat, I took the bin bags and I threw it downstairs. Luckily, our neighbours, they saw me in the morning. So I said, please, please, guys, can you uh, um, um, call me the cab? And the girl called the cab for me, and the cab called, and she was just there letting me know, you know, at the yeah. door side. And she's like, yeah, 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 yeah come. So um, the minute I wanted to leave, because I've been asking for my passport, for my documents and my child's document, they were refusing to give me even my bank cards. As an adult as I was, a mother to somebody, they were still holding on to my documents. They were still holding on to my passport, my bank cards. They wouldn't allow me to hold it. I don't know what their fear was. Um, so I was demanding for it nicely. Oh, it was just a battle. They refused to give it to me. But then luckily, the nursery of my child, they were asking for the documents to um, keep it in it. Yeah. So I told her earlier on to inform her husband to get the documents ready for me on a Wednesday so that I can take it to the nursery. They thought I was lying. And it came Wednesday and I asked, okay, um, please, can I have the passports mm -hmm. and stuff? She started accusing me, doing all these assumptions like, oh, I know you're trying to leave. You've been always wanting to leave. I'm like, I'm not going anywhere. So the minute she said that, um, I said to her, can you stop accusing me? Stop accusing me because what you're doing is not good. Stop accusing me. I just asked you for a simple document. I need to do it for my child. And they didn't listen. So her husband now was trying to um, understand me. Mm. And then he said to me, okay, calm down, calm down. Um, so I was, you got the document. I got the document. You. And then, boom, you I went. left and never returned. But before I left... I took out everything that I had in my heart, what they were doing to me. I was questioning them. I said to them, can I ask you both the question? Why don't you allow me to communicate with my twin sister back home? Why have you hid uh, such important information to me about my biological family? Why have you me, um, been maltreating us like this? Why? They didn't have any question, uh, I mean, any answer to give me. And they started crying. Um, the husband kneeled down and started saying, me, you, me, I was the one that brought you to the UK. One thing that I want to put across to someone out there who's um, invited family members to the UK, I want to um, advise you. Even if you've brought your family members to the UK, you don't have any right to control their lives. Let them live their lives. You don't have any right to curse them because you see the help that you've rendered to them to bring them here. It will be worthless. It will be in vain because now you are now cursing them. It will not be for your own benefit. You know, bless them, but stop trying to control them and stuff because otherwise you will lose your respect. So now you have forgiven them. I have forgiven them. They're still them. alive. They might be watching. Yeah, they might be watching. They might be watching and yeah. you've forgiven them. So... After you, you were able to go to uni, you have your princess now, you're married now, yeah, and and you've written this is your fourth book, yeah, this is my fourth book, the Heritage Seven Years Wait Wasn't a Waste. So, you, you, you want to read this book, you want to get it. It's got she's an angel, she's got a pregnant angel. I've never <laughs> seen a pregnant angel, but. What we want to say um, this afternoon to people, as you have said, that, you know, families are controlling um, whether it's their children, their biological children or not their biological children and people going um, through abuse and especially mental health. You've gone ahead and, and done a course in uni about mental health yes. and now you advocate for mental health. And I saw the mental health. They were you seriously 
are into it and you, you, you talk about it. What do you want to tell families out there? I know you've just said something. Mm. What do you want to tell, especially mothers yes. out there in terms of how they treat their children? Whether it's a biological mom or um, Looked adopted or, yeah. Okay. Thank you for that question. Um, what I want to say to um, African parents, moms, not just African parents, just parents in general, especially mothers, you know, uh, mental health is real. And um, I need you to understand that your children are going through a lot. Um, when they're coming back home from school, they expect to be happy to um, live at peace. So in, instead of adding on to their stress from school, you know, reduce it. I want to advise every parent, you know, to treat every child well. Because what goes around comes back around. The same way you treat another, the same way they will treat you. The same way you treat other people's kids. Um, the same way they will treat your children. So we need to be very careful with our actions. Even the Bible tells us to love one another. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. It is a commandment. First of all, start loving yourself and then start loving your children and other people's children. Um, I want to say that you shouldn't be using your children for your own benefit. I was being used by them for their own benefit. They were ashamed as church leaders that I was I was um, pregnant outside of wedlock, but they, they caused it. And um, so they tried to now give me another Nigerian guy so that I'll be engaged with him. But then I came to find out it was the same situation where they were trying to use me to give him papers again. So you trying to use your child for your own benefits, knowing that that thing that you're trying to do will destroy your child, um, that's not a good route to go. Um, I would encourage parents, show your children the way of the Lord. The best gift that you can give to your child is Jesus Christ. The best gift that you can give to your child is a relationship with God. Because when the world is, 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 is dealing with them, they, they will have Jesus to cry to. They will go back to God to cry to. You, the mother, may not be there anymore. The, you, the dad, you may not be there anymore. You know, the family may abandon them. They may have nobody to speak for them. But when they have Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, the only person that can save you. There's a scripture, pastor, that was helping me during all those periods of my pains and stuff. Um, Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, it says, um, um, I can do all things through Christ the Lord who strengthens me. You know, I believe and I strongly believe that uh, you can do all things. If I was able to come out of my traumas victoriously, come out of the bullying, the physical abuse, um, the emotional abuse, if I was able to come out of it victoriously, I believe you can too. Like I always say, if your faith says yes to God, God can never say no to you because when Omega wins, it is done. And the fact that wow. you're able to to believe in yourself. I want to encourage you to use your voice. Do not be afraid. Do not be ashamed of what you're going through right now. Listen, um, you keeping quiet about that situation, do you know how many destinies that you're blocking to be birthed? The minute I decided to speak up and use my voice, a lot of destinies were birthed. Mm -hmm. A lot of purposes, a lot of ministries, a lot of marriages were birthed. A lot of healing started to occur from so many people's lives the minute I started to speak up. Wow. It only takes one person and then everything can change. Fantastic. It only takes one person. It mm. only takes one person. She could have evangelized and be praised. Kabisela could have, could have stayed and died and gone. And you and I wouldn't be hearing her story today. But she gather the courage and escaped <laughs> there is that movie maybe we have to find we have to have a movie but yeah. then she escaped and today she's a a beautiful wife mother she gave her life to christ she's an evangelist she preaches you know a uh, uh, a first lady an advocate award winning yeah. singing praising all the talents all the things that is in her Today, we feel like we're in church, you know. <laughs> sometimes, as we're wrapping up, sometimes a lot of people go through all these stuff and 
their destiny is killed. And then we have some, like this amazing woman here, amazing lady, who said, no, I will rise up and thrive. Why don't you rise up and thrive yeah. and be that person, whether you're a man, whether you're a woman, that person that you're destined to be, so that through you, other doors and other destinies, other people's life will be saved. I hope you enjoy this amazing conversation this, this, this afternoon. I know it, it was deep, but then I know we have also learned something. Thank you so much. Look at you today. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> Thank you. I see you going places, winning all the awards. Mm -hmm. The last time you were in Luton, receiving an award, you were in the, on BBC and all that. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Thank you. And well done. So how is your twin? Um, my twin is very well. I think that's the story for another day. Is she here now or is she still back home? Okay. Uh, me and my husband, especially... When I met my husband in 2015, we were planning to get married and stuff. He asked me my story. I told him everything, and I told him about my twin sister. And bless him. And, yeah, and he's an activist, so he hates um, parents who, like, accuse kids who are witches because mm. they were accusing us that we were witch, mm. witches and stuff like that. So he hated that. So he was fighting to get you know, um, justice for those kids. And he now helped me to get my twist sister back to the UK. He's, her passports were um, expired, her documents, she didn't have no documents. So what he needed to do is to speak to people that he knew, mm. hire people that he knew to um, get my sister here. Um, my husband is like a second father to us here. Um, this is your husband. What yes. do you expect? Yeah, everything for me. My mom even said to him, listen, you, you are her husband, you are her father, you are everything. Listen, I'm entrusting you, my child. Um, and um, what I could say is that my husband did not only bring my sister back to the UK. He actually gave mm. her into marriage as wow. well and took the traditional rights sent it back to our family in the congo and they accepted it and now my sister is married and has got a baby and she's living happily so happy yeah. it's a happy ending yeah it's one day you ending. will hear from her one day it's a happy ending so yes. you can have your happy ending <laughs> of and course. so now you found your biological mom yes your biological family yes and then and uh, we're thankful hobby is here in the studio as well <laughs> with the baby so maybe another day we will invite a whole family to yeah. come so shout out to hobby thank you so much for all that you do for evangelist now let me praise Kabasela. thank you so much for coming to share his story please go on uh, where can we find you? Where can we find you? Okay, you can find me on Instagram. So my Instagram handle is Naomi Praise um, underscore official. On Facebook, it's Evangelist Naomi Praise Cabaselli. Um, on YouTube, it's Naomi Praise. On Amazon, it's Naomi Praise Cabaselli. And we have our website. So it's www mpcministries.org where you will find us and our ministry along with my husband dr leon cabaselli and and all the things that the great things she's doing and her amazing books as well i hope you have learned something please if you are in an abusive home you know if you need help please don't suffer in silence get help mm. get help your mental health is so important to um some of us at the other side, your mental health, your life matters. If you need help, seek help. Speak to someone. Don't die and go and not fulfill your purpose in life. Thank you so much for joining us. Make sure you share the story with others and always tune in to Omega TV UK. I'm your host, Nana Church. I have a wonderful Sunday. Bye-bye. person is arrested and taken to a police station or if the police invite you to the police station for a voluntary interview. You have a right to free independent legal advice. Adoku Solicitors is authorized to provide free independent legal advice at police stations in England and Wales. So anytime you are taken to the police station, remember 
to say that your solicitors are adequate solicitors. Are you in the UK and in need of immigration help? Do you require expert legal representation to regularise your stay or renew your existing leaves to remain? Do you require advice or representation regarding a personal injury or criminal matter? If the answer is yes, then you do not need to look any further. Aduku Solicitors is here to provide you with all the expert legal advice and representation you require. Be it immigration, criminal law, appeal against conviction or appeal against sentence, family law, personal injury, civil litigation, employment law or housing law. The Duku Solicitors is your trusted one-stop legal services provider with expert solicitors and caseworkers on standby to assist. Our police station emergency number is 07792 459 339. You can also call the Duku Solicitors on 0207 183 1479. You can locate the Duku Solicitors at 662 Old Kent Road, London, SE15 1JF. Are you ready for the ultimate property and lifestyle experience? Get ready for the Ghana Property and Lifestyle Expo 2023, coming to two exciting locations. Join us in London on the 11th and 12th of November, where leading reputable real estate developers will be waiting to meet you face to face. Be inspired by industry experts as they provide thought-provoking panel discussions and live Q&A sessions. And finally, mark your calendars for the 16th and 17th of December when the expo lands in Accra, Ghana. Experience the vibrant lifestyle and rich culture of Ghana while exploring investment opportunities in the thriving real estate market. Our expo will also feature exhibitors ranging from banking and legal services to estate and property management. Get all the support and information you need under one roof. So whether you're looking to invest, visit or simply explore the world of real estate, the Ghana Property and Lifestyle Expo 2023 is the place to be. Don't miss out on this incredible opportunity. Book your tickets now via Eventbrite for the Ghana Property and Lifestyle Expo 2023. Dream it, live it, you don't want to miss out. My name is Kofi Adoku. I'm a principal solicitor at Adoku Solicitors. I am also a duty solicitor. Anytime a person is arrested and taken to a police station, or if the police invite you to the police station for a voluntary interview, you have a right to free independent legal advice. Adoku Solicitors is authorized to provide free independent legal advice at police stations in England and Wales. So anytime you're taken to the police station, remember to say that your solicitors are Adokus solicitors. Are you in the UK and in need of immigration help? Do you require expert legal representation to regularize your stay or renew your existing leaves to remain? Do you require advice or representation regarding a personal injury or criminal matter? If the answer is yes, then you do not need to look any further. Aduku Solicitors is here to provide you with all the expert legal advice and representation you require. Be it immigration, criminal law, appeal against conviction or appeal against sentence, family law, personal injury, civil litigation, employment law or housing law. The Duku Solicitors is your trusted one-stop legal services provider with expert solicitors and caseworkers on standby to us. Our police station emergency number is 07792 459 339. You can also call the Duku Solicitors on 0207 183 1479. You can locate the Duku Solicitors at 662 Old Kent Road, London, SE15 1JF. Are you ready for the ultimate property and lifestyle experience? Get ready for the Ghana Property and Lifestyle Expo 2023, coming to two exciting locations. Join us in London on the 11th and 12th of November, where leading reputable real estate developers will be waiting to meet you face to face. Be inspired by industry experts as they provide thought-provoking